I think just initially I might just um, do it like that. Um, okay, some people are coming in now. Okay, uh, so uh, just hi everybody. Hope everyone's had a, a good Monday. Um, so first, just waiting. Going to give it a couple of minutes just for um, to let people join. Um, and maybe can I just um, check to see if uh, you know? Just want to make sure everybody can hear me. Uh, so maybe what I can do is in the chat, um, we can maybe everyone can just introduce themselves. Just say hello, just wave. Um, someone just let me know if you can hear me. Uh, I just, um, so hi everybody, I just typed uh, a message in the chat room. So can someone just let me know, uh, make sure they can hear me. Just want to make sure everyone can hear, okay. Just say yes or wave. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So just wait in another minute or so. I think um, people's like still coming on. So hi, Waikong. Hi, Uzma. Okay, so uh, we're just going to get started. I'm going to share my screen. So hope everyone's had a good day. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is for uh, fundraising in Hong Kong. And just wanted to, so I don't know if, uh, if you all know me, but I'm Julio, uh, found co-founder and CEO of, of Happier and H Academy. Um, so just want to just give you a quick introduction on H Academy. So. We're helping individuals and also organizations to help uh, upskill and reskill, uh, particularly in those sort of in demand um, kind of areas. And um, really just want to kind of help empower people. Um, and so, particularly for today, we really want to empower um, founders or investors or anyone that's in the sort of fundraising uh, world in Hong Kong, which actually I'm, I'm one of them. So, I definitely find this uh, a very interesting topic. 
Um, and we've got someone who's very experienced, um, CFO from Flowship as well, and had a, a lot of, um, I'll let him introduce himself a little bit more, but, um, you know, going to be able to share a lot on um, some, some good uh, sort of advice and tips in, in this space. Uh, and then also in terms of Happier, um, Happier is a career platform. We're a holistic career platform. So we're really about helping uh, to give everybody the tools they need, uh, particularly like the world today is very changing very fast. So it's not just about finding the right jobs and companies, but also um, having the right skills and also career coaching. So we're quite a, a holistic platform. Um, but for today, it's H Academy. Um, so happy to answer any questions if, if anyone has that later on. Um, so I'm just going to uh, I'm going to pass it over to um, to Wolfgang, just, and I'm also just going to get his page up. So just give me one second. Yes. So hi guys. It's a pleasure to meet you all. So you got my, my page up? Just yes. Okay. Awesome, here we go. So just as a brief introduction to myself, I've been in Auckland for about 12 years now. Um, I have uh, been part of the startup ecosystem in, in Hong Kong for quite some time now. Uh, I was previously the CFO of, of Bloomy, which was a um, spa and beauty booking uh, platform in Hong Kong. And um, we, um, we ran this company for about six years, had multiple fundraisers from angel investments to, um, to um, larger rounds, million dollar rounds, convertible notes, we had options. All of these nice technicalities that are really interesting for um, optimizing your, um, your, your fundraisers in terms of valuation and what the right amount should be. Uh, currently, I'm uh, the, the founder of StartupValuationSchool.com, which is um, a website and platform that um, helps you to not only learn how to value your company, but also learn a little bit more about the technicalities of especially term sheets and, and contracts, which I believe is um, very valuable to you in terms of understanding, um, especially value besides pricing of shares and um, also in, in terms of how much money you can raise and so on. And uh, I'm also the CFO of Flowship, which is um, a leading um, direct-to-consumer brand uh, e-commerce logistics fulfillment company. Well, that's a mouthful right there for you. Uh, but essentially it's an e-commerce fulfillment company um, operating out of Hong Kong, um, delivering goods to, um, to, to online customers around the world, essentially. Okay, just to briefly look into this again, predict the future of, uh, pre predict the future of your company with unit economics. Um, so what I was trying to show you here was a um, income statement, uh, very high level. Um, again, I mentioned the various components really don't matter too much to you right now. Revenues, cost of goods sold, gross profits, and so on. Just um, assume they're there, 2018 to 2020 are your historical figures that an investment banker using this investment banker method would have received um, from a financial report. And then they would go about thinking in terms of how to predict the future based on this. So uh, what I was trying to say here, you uh, essentially do a compound annual growth rate across the various periods that you're looking at, you see 2.74%, and then you try to predict the future and say, okay, let's think the revenues grow by 2.74% into the future forever. And you start your financial model off like this. And then secondly, I was saying, um, cost of goods sold in relation to revenues is a typical way to uh, predict your expenses. And uh, in this specific case, you have uh, a percentage which goes around 25% um, in relation to revenues. And if you would extrapolate that into the future, you, you, you get your figures like that as well. Um, interesting approach when you have the past in hand, but of course, again, I think now that you have this slide in front of you, you can very much imagine that 
if you're a startup, you just don't have 2018, 2019, and 20 um, as your as your past figures, and it will be quite difficult for you to come up with any reasonable uh, figure if you had only operated for three months. So again, this was the 25 percent. So here with these um, bars, I was just giving you the the logic flow of the investment banker method versus the startup method. Investment banker method starts with historicals uh, from from research or from from whatever numbers are available internally. Uh, very often financial statements out in the public. And then you assume a certain growth rate that you predicted based on, on the past. Uh, you multiply that uh, against past track records to get revenues for the future. And based on these revenues, you essentially model out uh, your budgets. So all the budgets are relative to revenues. And again, the problem is you don't have history in a startup and there is just no logical connection if you aggregate I mean, essentially, probably relatively many revenue streams in, in, in this kind of fashion and all these individual expenses that are underlying cost of goods sold and SG&A. So again, startup method of financial modeling, you start with marketing budget, you want to go into unit economics. The unit economics are the drivers for anything related customer and product and the individual pricing. And, and churn how, ma how many months or years a customer will stay with you. And from that basis on, you have um, a still hypothetical, but much more educated guess on what your revenues and cost of goods sold will look like. And then also have a basis to calculate capital expenditures, CapEx and admin expenses to support your growth. So. If you come up with marketing numbers, again, that um, um, let's say 100,000 US dollars a month for marketing spend and your users grow like crazy, then of course you need to have enough em employees to actually support that growth. And that would not be shown in unit economics that needs to be modeled out in CapEx and admin expenses. So again, now we are back where, <laughs> where, where, where the spring capture came back in. Uh, what are unit economics, the direct revenues and costs associated with the business model per unit of sales? And I was trying to say um, most businesses go actually by customers as opposed to uh, product definition in, in terms of this unit of sales. Don't worry, we're going to jump into this a little bit more in detail. So customers is our way to go here. Now, if you go down the road of Customer uh, of, of customer segmentation and customer breakdown of your unit economics, you will get into the all important customer acquisition cost and customer lifetime value or CAC or CAC for short for customer acquisition cost and LTV for lifetime value of your customer. What does that mean? Essentially, customer acquisition cost is how much does it cost to get one customer and once you have one customer, how much can you earn from one customer? That is the definition of the lifetime value. Now, surprisingly, CAC and LTV are not really taught that much in universities. And again, for some reason, still there are always somebody who hasn't heard of it before. Um, and it is a very interesting concept in that you, you circle your assumptions around the question, well, maybe you're you're, you're, you have a lot of customers and, and they make money, but acquisition is just way too expensive. And the more money you spend on acquisition, you're maybe not even making that money back because your lifetime value is, is uh, just not high enough. So you really want to dive into this. Now, how do you get to customer acquisition cost itself? There are multiple definitions to this and it depends on your industry. Here, I'm just going to go very high level so that we'll get a broad understanding. Custom acquisition can be thought of in terms of advertising expenses for a certain period, mostly monthly, because that's how you want to predict out your numbers, divided by the number of customers. And the other definition that is also very, very common is user acquisition cost. So think in terms of a website or a mobile app 
how much does it cost you to get one individual user to your website? It's the CPC probably for you um, from, from, from Google or from Facebook or to get them to download and open your app. So in the case of Bloomy, our spa and beauty booking marketplace, we were always thinking in terms of user acquisition because we wanted to get people to download and open our app. So if you pay 20 Hong dollars, you have them on the app, but they're not a customer yet. And hence you need to divide the, customer, the user acquisition by the conversion rate. And I'm not writing this all out, otherwise the slides get too messy, but conversion rate of user to customer. And later on, you can be much more fancy about it and you can say, okay, what is a repeat customer? Do you want a repeat conversion rate? Do you want to have all kinds of sales funnels and so on? But essentially customer acquisition cost, how much does it cost you to get one customer? And on the um, customer lifetime value side of things, you really want to think in terms of gross profit per customer divided by the churn rate. And again, this has to be thought of in terms of the same period so if you go by month for the customer acquisition cost, you also want to go by um, the month for your lifetime value. So essentially, if you think in terms of Bloomy, we had on average one and a half bookings per month. So if you then calculate what is the gross profit per customer, it is essentially your commission minus anything that is very direct and it could be specifically hosting costs or um, maybe even customer support costs if you wanted to. Um, and then you have to actually uh, multiply this times these bookings per month. Otherwise you don't have the monthly period there. And the churn rate would be also for the same period. So you will want to figure out what is your monthly churn, not let's say your yearly churn or something like that. So you divide it by a percentage and then you get a figure. So make an example, food delivery app, user acquisition cost, currency doesn't matter here so much, but this is probably US dollars, two US dollars, conversion rate, user to customer, um, then you have $2 divided by 5% conversion rate. So a customer, somebody who actually not only opens the food delivery app, but actually makes a booking would then be 40, let's say US dollars here. And on the lifetime value side, you would want to think in terms of what is actually your uh, gross profit or um, uh, the amount of money that you take in. I simplified this here, um, but I want you to still think in terms of what is GMV uh, because the um, typical food delivery customer will book maybe, let's say a pizza, Pizza costs you 10 US dollars. Now, this is not your revenue. This is not your gross profit. That is uh, the gross merchandise value or GMV as it's called in, in, in these kinds of businesses. So how much essentially value are you selling through your food delivery marketplace? And part of that could be your revenue and your gross profit. Now I say, okay, let's, let's just make it easy. Delivery fee on top. $1 in reality, probably there will be some kind of commission, maybe monthly fees that um, Food Panda and Deliveroo will actually charge uh, those restaurants or maybe technology fees for these printers and so on. Here, make it simple, $1. Um, and we say um, the revenue is actually just directly also your, your gross profit. And you have four orders per month because food delivery is a little bit more, um, more, more, transactions than, for example, beauty bookings. And you assume a very aggressive, actually negative churn of 5%. And you would get uh, $1 times the four orders divided by 5% and you get um, $80 of lifetime value. Now, if you see $80 to $40, uh, you say, okay, LTV to CAC is 2X. Um, it feels it's at least positive, but I can tell you right away that's a very uh, bad LTV to CAC ratio in, in these kinds of businesses. There's a lot more detail, which we um, can really go to uh, much into detail here. 
because timing matters. How long does it take you to get all of this customer acquisition cost back? And how much risk is in there? You would want to have probably five to 10 X at least in here. But this is the overall concept for um, customer acquisition cost and lifetime value. And um, if you get into detail, you have the basis for the startup method of um, financial modeling. So if you think in terms of our stream of logic, you start, let's say, with an advertising budget of whatever, 100,000 US dollars per month. Uh, you just figured out your customer acquisition costs and lifetime values, and of course, all of the other figures that are relating to that, which then allow you to figure out um, how many new customers can you actually have per monthly or per period cohort, but it's always going to be monthly. And you will also know what is your churn on the same period on, on a per month basis. And in the financial model, you would break this down really in waterfalls. So did you know how many users did you have? How many customers did you have? How many did you churn? And if you have your monthly active customers, then you have a starting point to multiply this times revenues, times uh, cost of services or cost of goods sold, figure out what is your gross profit, figure out what um, your individual components to your income statements are. And um, you can think in terms of all of these wonderful variable expenses. And that is then the beginning to think in terms of your capital expenditures and admin expenses and let's say food delivery app here, the vast majority goes towards marketing and maybe a little bit for hosting and especially salaries, either internally or through some kind of compensation for the writers, um, which could be freelancers and so on. All of these business tend to be as asset light as possible. So they won't buy bikes or they won't buy office space or they won't start their own kitchens if they don't have to. Um, so those are the drivers that you think of in terms of here. All right, so that as an initial introduction to why you should really use unit economics for your financial modeling, for your budgeting, for your planning as a whole. Um, again, the investment banker method that most people know of when they had some stint in an investment bank or when they still remember their textbooks or um, university courses or actually go for any sort of financial modeling class that is available online Think of um, training the street or uh, Wall Street prep. All of these companies, they usually go with the investment banker method. They base everything on historicals, grow everything by percentages um, based on the past, figure out what the revenues are, maybe uh, um, base your, your um, cost of goods sold as a relative figure to uh, revenues, and then figure out what fixed components you might have but essentially it's all uh, very much history driven. And then they focus way too much on building cash flows and financial statements, the three statement analysis, like balance sheet, income statement, cash flow statement, which you don't really need, especially if you're in the angel uh, rounds. Um, and um, the startup method, again, no historicals, you just don't have them. You should start with the unit economics. You um, figure out what are your um, expense budgets and so on based on these unit economics and relative to them, how to enable the growth, how to make your company um, investable and, and, and grow at a trajectory that investors find it interesting to invest in. And for reaching this goal, especially in the below $1 million range, you shouldn't worry too much about balance sheets and cash flow statements, but really focus in terms of revenue and income statement. And if you have a good revenue model, even if it is just for the first one to three years, in the very early stages, this can be enough if it is uh, unit economics driven, because 
it gives you a feel for, well, is there actually a market? Like, for example, um, do you have an app that wants to figure out what kind of espresso stores are available in Hong Kong only? And there are 500 espresso shops um, and you can make, I don't know, 500 Hong Kong dollars per espresso shop per month. And you just immediately realize your market is not that big. And um, this can actually really validate a lot of stuff for you. So think in terms of unit economics, think in terms of growth that is attractive for, um, for investors and what that specifically means. Um, we can go into that into the future. Um, yeah, that is unit economics and financial planning. The second part that I wanted to talk to you about today actually goes towards the negotiation side of a fundraise. Now, a lot of people think in terms of fundraisers as, okay, I need to have my valuation. Valuation means share price. I want to have a high valuation because it looks, of course, great. Uh, to everybody that you want to brag about it and um, you think well I have a thousand shares if I apply a hundred dollars to my thousand shares now suddenly I made a hundred thousand US dollars on on paper money and uh, the, that feels very great but there are so many other factors that go into uh, um, shares um, and I want to pick one term to illustrate that fact and that is um, my very much favorite term, which is liquidation preference. Liquidation preference is one that really uh, defines um, any sort of term sheet. And i tell you in a second. First, if you read the news, TechCrunch or whatever, you will read uh, typically headlines like, after the latest funding round, startup XYZ is now worth $500 million or startup ABC just became a unicorn, unicorn meaning billion dollars or above, US of course. And this essentially goes to back to the valuation and it essentially goes back to share price. And it is not incorrect, but it is also not the full truth and we're gonna know why that is. And a couple different terms that have an impact here. Liquidation preference. What is liquidation preference? Essentially, the liquidation preference means it is a right for preferred shares to give, get paid something before other shareholders in an exit or liquidation of a company. For those of you who don't know what preferred shares are, a startup has two different classes of shares. Ordinary, which is everything that usually founders and maybe employees get, and then investor type shares, which are essentially also shares, but they have some preferential treatment, extra rights, hence they're called preferred shares. And what do they get? They get something, right? So something means an early payout. Um, maybe they, they get the investment back. Maybe they get a special dividend. Maybe they get their initial investment plus something else uh, before other shareholders get paid. And the initial idea of this is, well, they paid so much money into your company. If you just unwind the company right away, uh, the distribution would be by uh, number of shares held and it would be an immediate redistribution of wealth to the ordinary shareholders. And for the founders not to run away with, your, with, with the investor's money, you need to have certain protections to uh, not make this happen. So essentially at, at a bare minimum in let's say 99% of investment deals, investors will get liquidation preference for at least their initial investment. Now, liquidation preference can have multiple different angles and I'll, I'll summarize them right here for you as well. They can be participating and non-participating. So that goes back to what I just mentioned before. Um, either they just get the initial investment back or they may get something extra. Um, non-participating means they get only their investment back 
whatever they paid in at the beginning. If they invested a million dollars, they get a million dollars and nothing else. And for any sort of upside, they need to convert their shares into ordinary shares on an exit. And um, that, that, that only makes them whole at a later stage. Don't worry, I have graphs for you in a second. So if you have a feeling like, ah, I don't understand it, it's coming up. Participating means they participate and, and they would get more than just the investment. Um, there can be a, a specific ranking as to where do individual investors rank in a payout scenario among themselves. So imagine you had an angel round, they have preference and now the series A comes in, they want a ranking that is above the angel investors because they've paid so much more money and they just came in recently, you have more risk. So that is um, ranking between the individual investors can also be all pro rata among themselves. There could be single return or multiple returns, so they could get a return on their initial investment plus any remaining payouts or a multiple of those you can really make this complicated. And they could even have a guaranteed dividend or guaranteed interest as they sometimes call it. So to really make it complicated. The, the reason why they come up with all of these terms is because you die by um, a thousand cuts essentially. And individually they sound really small, but in a second with my graphs here, you will see why this is so onerous and so crazy expensive. Let's look into an example. Imagine you're trying to raise 500,000 US dollars, angel round, highly applicable to all of you guys here in the, in the room, um, at a $2.5 million post money valuation. Uh, I just use two uh, post money valuation because it's practical right here for the example. As a side note, always quote your prices in pre money because if the round increases, your initial pre money doesn't change. If you if you raise your round to six hundred thousand, and you you quote it at two point five million post money, suddenly your valuation goes down. But it's just a side note. I'm I'm making this for illustration purposes. If you go by um, uh, 2.5 million post and 500k as a individual um, first angel round. Then the angel A after this round will own 20% of the company and ordinary, meaning the founders probably and maybe some early invested, uh, early early employees uh, will will own 80%. Um, and how does a payout like this would look like? Um, let's let's put in a graph right here as well. So. No, let's, let's not put a graph in here so I can guide you through it. Um, so imagine you have a payout valuation of $1 million, $2.5 million, or $5 million, meaning an exit value of the company that circles above or below your initial valuation of this angel round. The initial implied valuation for this funding round never changes. So the percentages owned by Angel A and ordinary never changes. Ordinary keeps 80%, angel A keeps 20%. If you have an exit for $1 million, of course, everybody will be super annoyed because it is selling the company at below the initial investment. Um, and, and, and this is hopefully not happening for you, but it could happen. At least the investment doesn't change. If you would plot this against various payout scenarios, you would see down on the X axis, you have what is the payout scenario. So from 250,000 US dollars to 5 million in this case, you see that the payout for angel A is always 20% of whatever is being paid out. And for ordinary, it is always just in relation to their 80% ownership. So at the 5 million mark, it's a little bit hard to see here because there's, there, there's um, um, no lines in here, but um, essentially 80% gets you $4 million out of 5 million, 80%. And down here you have 20%, it's 1 million. Great for you as a founder. Um, and you can see everything that is below 2.5. The problem for the angel A investor is, 
well, they paid him $500,000, but they're getting back less than their original amounts. And um, you could argue, especially if this happens relatively quickly after the investment, that's kind of unfair because they're putting cash and there's distribution, which is way above the original investment. They should at least get a return on their investment. Um, and as you can see here from a $2.5 million payout, obviously ordinary gets way more than $500,000. Um, incomes liquidation preference. So let's look at a basic um, liquidation preference. In, in jargon, you could call this a 1x non-participating liquidation preference. What does 1x non-participating mean? It essentially means that the investor gets 1x or exactly their initial investment, but they are not participating at any further return um, above their initial investment. How does that look? I'm gonna jump in here with a graph. Now, again, the, the teal colored or green colored graph is our angel A and the black colored is our ordinary shares. The dotted line is the line that I had shown you just before and um, would have represented a pure percentage based, pure share number based distribution of wealth upon an exit. So if you think in terms of a, let's make it easy. Let's think in terms of a payout scenario of 500,000 US dollars, which is remember exactly equal to what Angel A paid in. Now, if they have a one X non-participating liquidation preference, it means as long as there is money, they get at least their 500,000 US dollars back. So, $500,000 is available, they get $500,000. If there's only $250,000 available, they get $250,000. Obviously, if you only have $250,000, there's no money left over for ordinary shares, hence ordinary shares is down here at exactly zero. It starts for them to provide any sort of return once you hit the $500,000 mark, which is where Angel A is absolutely flat. Why is Angel A flat and making no return? Because they are non-participating in this scenario. So it means their Angel A shares are worth only up to $500,000, nothing else. Now you might ask me, well, why are they gaining momentum over here beyond $2.5 million? Well. That is the point where it makes sense for a liquidation uh, for a preferred shareholder to say, okay, screw my preferred shares. I want to convert them into ordinary shares, which is another one of those wonderful rights that uh, preferred shares have. They are allowed to convert into ordinary shares, usually one for one. One preferred share turns into one ordinary share. That means if there is enough money beyond this point of 2.5 million, suddenly it makes sense for them to convert back into ordinary shares and simply benefit on a percentage basis or on a share basis, on a relative basis to ordinary shares. So even though this is one graph, essentially the angel A shares, they always perform on the $500,000, but at this point of indifference here where, where you don't have um, the, um, the benefit from your, your angel A's anymore, you switch back to, to ordinary on an exit and uh, you benefit on your percentage ownership. So they still actually have an upside beyond the 500,000, but not technically on the angel A. It's very confusing. I know a lot of people confuse that in, 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 the, in, in um, their conversations about um, deal terms, it is based on the conversion factor, switching your, your preferred shares to ordinary. Now, this means then essentially you, you have your dotted line at the point of indifference. Not only do 
Angel A, benefit again from um, your the, the relative percentage. But actually, you as a founder who owns ordinary shares, you suddenly don't have any disadvantage from this liquidation preference. Let me say this again. Beyond the point of indifference, you as a founder don't have any disadvantage from the liquidation preference, as long as it is 1x non-participating. It is actually a very neat and actually, in my view, a very fair term uh, that protects investors from mistreatment by, let's say, founders who want to play around with share ownership and just directly unwind companies after, after they raised a bunch of money or by, let's say, liquidating before all the money is used up and they just give up or maybe there is an exit, but it's a terrible exit and it's below the last funding round. Think in terms of ABC, uh, serious investments. There's all kinds of scenarios where uh, there could be an exit that is below the last funding round. So 1X non-participating is quite attractive, but here comes the kicker. And that is anything that is, um, beyond um, pure non-participating. So let's think in terms of uh, 1x non-participating. Thank you. Um, so what is a 1, 1x participating? So 1x still means you get your initial money back, but participating means the, the, the the investor participates in any money distribution beyond distribution of the initial investment. So remember we said $500,000 is uh, the point where suddenly the ordinary shareholder gets some kind of money back. Um, this is when the angel A shareholder got their $500,000 back. Everything that comes beyond the next hundred thousand, the next one million, next five hundred thousand dollars, is actually distributed on this twenty eighty um, distribution, whatever your your, your shareholding would say. And um, if you think in terms of this, you suddenly realize your wonderful two point five million dollar post money valuation actually is not a two point five million dollar valuation anymore, because here yeah so remember the dotted line would be 80 20 well if you calculate it out the black line and the the, the colored out teal line is actually at the end of five million dollars 72 percent versus 28 percent actually this percentage fluctuates across the line it's 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 not parallel right so for example if you're below the interlinking point of course the um, the teal line has much more percentage than 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 the ordinary share line, so it, it, it essentially flips. I think I even put it in here. Yeah, exactly. So at a one million, um, the ordinary shares only get forty percent of the payout, and Angel A uh, gets sixty percent of the payout, and that is what I was trying to say down here: an implied investment valuation based on various payout valuation scenarios. So if you are at um, let's say $2.5 million uh, where we had the initial point of indifference before it's not $2.5 million anymore. It's actually as if you raised at a $1.4 million valuation last time when you had an angel A round. And if you end up selling your company for a million dollars only, your initial valuation actually only was $0.8 million. And funnily enough, actually into the future, no matter what your, um, um, exits are even if you sell a company for a billion dollars this is essentially a percentage that that evens out and it always adjusts a little bit these these distribution percentages but you will always have never really quite had the 2.5 million dollar post money valuation on your angel a now this is very critical to understand the two different scenarios that i gave you here one is a um, 1x non-participating and a 1x 
participating, whatever kicker on top, you suddenly give out significant value and your $500 million unicorn valuations, blah, 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 all of this stuff is still not totally inaccurate, but it's simply not the full picture. And the bigger the valuation rounds are, um, the more important can also be this um, liquidation preference, any sort of anti-dilution rights, readjustments of share distributions, guaranteed dividends, so on and so forth. Um, as I'm looking at the timing right here, I think um, I'm, I'm wrapping this up a little bit faster probably, but I'm just giving you um, um, an extra, just to give you a little detail level on what, what could else be there. People could come up with additional um, terms that impact your, your payouts. So instead of saying 1x participating, you could call this 1x participating and ah, we should have a little bit of return. I mean, think in terms of these terms, what does it look like if somebody writes it out in an email? It's like, oh, I want my money back. And of course I'm participating in, in, in any sort of distribution, but you know what, founder, I'm the first investor. So I should actually kind of have a real guaranteed um, return and since we all think in terms of equity versus loans and so on, and you think everything that is interest rate doesn't really bother me with, with, with dreaming of unicorns. So uh, let's, we give them 15% non-cumulative dividend on top of it. So you will immediately see that um, essentially in the early days, you have two stages to these payout scenarios because at some point, first you get the, the, your, your investment back and then you have further accelerated return until you have the full capacity to pay for 15% non cumulative dividends. And then up to forever, you have essentially very aggressive um, payout scenarios where the um, ordinary shareholder at a $1 million um, payout would have even less, like not even 40, 60, but only 28% of the final payout versus 72% for the angel A's. Massive redistribution. If you put in convertible notes that have flexible bands in terms of um, um, conversion into equity on the angel A or series A, then all of this gets hugely dilutive to ordinary shares. So um, again, think in terms of the whole breadth we had talked about initially about our unit economics, tried to make your models uh, somewhat as, as logic driven as possible so that you can predict the future as good as possible and make your startup as investable as possible. And now um, another angle, once you actually start getting into this discussion of can I raise money? Uh, yeah, we can get $500,000 or a couple hundred thousand dollars and you're actually only giving 20% away. No, not really. If you could bootstrap through these $500,000 and get into series A right away, you would be much better off no matter what the terms are. And especially if you have to agree to a um, strenuous uh, dilution protection or liquidation preference um, clause, um, simply because it redistributes so much wealth and you, I want you to be really mindful of that and not just think in terms of all of this stuff once you actually start talking to lawyers and side topic, always talk to lawyers, right? No matter how small this thing is, always talk to lawyers. Never, ne never just go and I know it, everything, um, you need advice on this. All right. I think, um, um, so I'm going to um, stop sharing the screen and uh, let's see if they're in the chat. Yes, there might be some for the screen. <laughs> yeah, so uh, okay. Sorry about the slides not working. Again. Yes. Um, I think like there was only for a very short period because, um, I th but I think someone said, thank you very informative session. Um, just wonder if we can watch the replay later. Um, I'll come back to you on that, but yes. Um, so I think now is a good time just to uh, just throw any questions. Um, I know like myself as a, as a co-founder, it's sometimes very confusing because I do search online and it's hard to get the right answer, but you know, 
<laughs> you have Wolfgang here who can really um, help. So I think there's a Q&A session here. Um, so I'm just going to jump in here. Uh, okay. Okay, so one question is, I am not sure if I understand correctly, I usually encounter the situation where incubators, investors ask for unique ideas to get funding to avoid conflicts of interest. How can we pitch the same idea for many investors at the same time? Um, so, I mean, if you're just really in the pitching stage of your startup, I mean, there, there is, um, um, if you're talking about regular investors, I mean, it, it's up to you. So, um, you talk to as many people as possible because you want to raise money for your startup and that is the main goal for yourself. Um, if you talk in terms of grants and, and, and sort of um, anything that has um, rules attached to it, like uh, cyberport and so on, if you take money from them, then typically there's rules and they're specific there to, to their various programs and you have to read up to them. But if it's really about angel investors, pitch to as many as you can. And only in the term sheet phase, which is the phase where somebody actually starts thinking, well, I, I like your idea. I'm, I'm starting to see there, 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 there's some sense to um, what you've planned here. Uh, they might give you a term sheet and it says um, they want to have exclusivity for the deal. Now, it can make sense to give exclusivity if, if, if you are in a stage where you have a good feeling, where you think um, things are coming along, and specifically you think that the investor actually has the money that they're talking about and is not just a no-name person that is a little bit um, um, too overconfident and just dumped uh, uh, non-compete in, 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 into your term sheet. Um, in, in, I would try to avoid not being able to talk to other people as much as you can. And very often you can negotiate against it, especially if um, this investor doesn't take the entire round or doesn't necessarily have the entire credibility to, um, to, to have a name in the market. I mean, especially in the angel realm, you, you encounter wealthy individuals who don't really have a public track record. And in those cases, usually you can get around this. And um, no matter what, always negotiate. If they say three months, say, okay, we can talk about one month. And um, then the next thing is actually term sheets very often are not signed. Um, so even if it comes into this conf um, conflict of interest part, um, if it's not even signed, then there's a lot of talk about it, but you, you and practically, practicality, you're still shopping around and um, it only gets into the contracting phase where you actually have said, okay, we agree on this term sheet. We know these guys have money. Uh, we can close the round. Um, let's give them exclusivity for the period of negotiating the final contract with this, which is share their agreements, 50 page documents. Let's do one month, uh, give them a little guarantee here. Okay, so a uh, question from Ambrose. Uh, what are the best ways to find and talk to angels in Hong Kong or Southeast Asia or GBA? Okay, so uh, multiple approaches and it's, it's very daunting. I, I can agree with you. So if, um, multiple routes, go pitch wherever you can, especially um, where it's for free, meaning you don't have to give up equity in the end um, for some kind of incubator or something. Um, like pitching is, is a great method. Um, you can always advertise by simply being um, online with your, with your startup, have a website as early as you can, um, but also LinkedIn. And I can tell you the, the, the first investor that we had in, um, in, in Bloomy, um, that investor actually found me on LinkedIn uh, because one of his employees was searching around um, for similar startups, they, they found us, um, got connected on LinkedIn, um, and uh, we had a coffee, and then subsequently 20, roughly 20 meetings to discuss what, what, what the business looks like. And as the person got confident that we're not just talking, but actually have staying power and revenue started to show up, 
um, then that person actually did what a lot of investors do, introduce their friends. So this entire concept of warm leads, meaning having somebody that introduces to somebody else really start happening once you have the first few guys. And once you um, become a little bit more known, how do you become known? Pitch as much as you can, have a website, uh, be out there, go to events as soon as events are possible again, or any sort of online sessions is potentially possible too. Of course, a little bit of a trick here. Um, but as much as you can reach out, reach out. And these things actually do work. And every time you speak to somebody, ask them the question, well, who do you think I should also talk to? And, um, um, or who could give me advice on my startup? Or ask other founders who could give me advice on the startup and try to snowball your networking that way. And uh, you would be surprised. You, you definitely don't need track record, but of course track record helps, um, but you will get in front of people as long as your story makes sense and you are persistent. Thank you. That's really great. And um, I also use LinkedIn a lot. I've uh, met a lot of investors on LinkedIn. Um, so I, I think also we, so please um, add any more questions um, in chat or, but just from before, it's interesting. We've got quite a mix of people here. Um, so we've got ed tech company, um, travel tech, so startup already launched, but part of MVP, AI plus marketplace. Um, so that's very interesting. Enterprise SaaS, marketplace, AI media and entertainment. Um, so yeah, quite a, quite a variety of um, startups here. Yeah. Well, one, one quick tip here in terms of fundraising. Um, one thing that investors very much look out for is traction in terms of revenues. So whatever you can, and this goes back to this entire topic of make your startup investable, whatever resources you have, try to think in terms of how can I get some kind of revenues and, and proof of concept that is beyond, I don't know, Facebook likes or uh, user numbers. Uh, because if you have some kind of, even at a low level track record that says, okay, we have $100 this month and $200 next month, and and it grows a little bit that really um, is what they ideally look for and it really validates one key concern that investors have in Hong Kong which is well Hong Kong is not China and Hong Kong is um, um, just 7 million people and you can't really grow into China mainland or you can't grow into Southeast Asia because there's different marketing dynamics, or you can't um, grow to uh, some other markets which have different unit economics. Um, those are sort of, um, let's say, partially valid stereotypes, um, which you can best combat by saying, okay, look at my revenues and look at what's already going. Um, so just while I, I think we'll probably wrap up soon, but we'll give it another five minutes in case people have questions. Um, what I wanted to also share was, um, you know, for anyone that wants to go into more depth, um, and, and this is sort of a topic that does require quite a bit more, um, a bit more work, um, there, there is a, a full-time course, um, which is uh, Startup Fundraising in Hong Kong, um, which I think you might have already seen since you've probably been on our website. Um, I might just get, uh, I think Wolfgang probably better uh, to give you a quick overview of it. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what we're trying to do with this course is to get you um, deal ready within the time of the course. So we have a seven week course here for you um, yeah. that starts out with essentially what you will have top of your mind when you start thinking about um, fundraising, which is the financial model process. I will go through unit economics in more detail, of course, try to think in terms of how to get your startup investable, um, budget in a way that you focus on the right things, but also be able to show the right numbers that are actually investable and show the right returns possible to invest in you by, from a VC point of view. And then we go into um, the entire world of pitching, the entire world of um, what does a pitch deck look like? Those essential 10, 12 pages. Try to make it 
um, comprehensive, but also um, well, time efficient, right? So there's a lot of people who spend um, weeks and months and, on, on write-ups and, and, and business plans and cash flow based financial models and balance sheets. And um, for, for the beginning phase, you really want to see it holistically, get your revenue model out there that is based in logic, but also producible in a relatively reasonable amount of time. Get um, the assumptions and, and, and projections that you produce in there and take it into a pitch deck that is convincing and then be able to pitch what you have and once you actually get to the lucky and fortunate position to negotiate a deal, then term sheets will become uh, very important. And that's why I wanted to focus on liquidation preference today, um, just to give you a flavor as to why it is so important to think of it holistically. And again, this course will also deal with your important terminologies. We will think in terms of angel rounds, um, series rounds, um, convertible notes, little bit on ESOPs, um, all of these things that you can hit the ground running without asking your $5,000 an hour lawyer all the time uh, to explain to you these basic concepts for your uh, context. And to wrap this all up, uh, we will have um, a small pitch competition at the end. So everything that you have learned uh, will be applied. You are supposed to then pitch towards uh, a small panel of um, actual investors so that you get this feedback, not only in terms of, well, you go to an incubator and pitch and then you don't really get feedback here. You actually get feedback where you um, get, get the inputs from us, uh, from, from myself and, and whoever's on the panel and um, really get you there within those two months. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Wolfgang. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty much a, a wrap. I think probably everyone's ready for dinner. So um, we'll call that a night. Um, uh, so we'll share the recording with anyone that's, um, anyone that's missed it. Um, and um, that's okay. Yes. Yeah, and then we can also share the slides with you. I think someone was asking. Um, but yeah, if you've got any questions, just reach out to Wolfgang or myself and we'd love to chat to you. So hope uh, that was helpful for everybody. Yeah, pleasure to talk to all of you. Great. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.